Today's scripture is going to be John 20, verses 1 through 10. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going together to the tomb. Both of them were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We're going to begin today a, a series called The Victor, where we talk about our victory in Jesus Christ. And we remember um, the life of Christ. We remember the cross, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ. All of those are filled with power and victory. He is the victor, and through him we do have victory now, that main event that we associate with the power of God is the resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, his disciples, we saw, were bewildered and afraid. When they buried him, they thought that their hope was lost. But when they saw that empty tomb, um, there was confusion. They didn't understand and probably too afraid to believe and have any type of hope. But when they saw the resurrected Christ, when they saw the resurrected Jesus, they rejoiced. The resurrection of Jesus shows the power of God over sin and death. And today, Easter Sunday, we remember what Jesus said before he died and rose from the dead. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and our hope of that resurrection one day in our lives, we celebrate victory. Victory over the world, victory over flesh, victory over sin, and victory over death. And so we need to today look at the resurrection and see what the resurrection provides for us each day of our life as we follow Christ. So let's begin as we look at our outline today. First of all... The resurrection provides peace, and we need peace in our lives. In fact, Jesus says, in me you have peace. Peace is to be calm and collected no matter the circumstances. And I don't know if you knew this, but the peace with God is a result of God's grace and our salvation. So on Wednesday afternoon, we're studying the book of Romans, and as we're about to chapter, we're in chapter four now, and as we've um, been going through these first few chapters of Romans, you can see a very clear progression of what God is doing and what God has promised us. So in Romans chapter one, we have one of the greatest statements of the power of the gospel that's found in the Bible. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. 
As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so that's the, that statement to kind of set the stage of the whole book of Romans as we start going through that. But the bad news is also found in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2 that basically says if you're trying to prove yourself righteous, righteous enough for God by following the law of God, it ain't going to happen. That's not in the King James, I don't think, but um, it's not going to happen that way. Because uh, we find that whether it's following the law of God that we find in the Bible, that God reveals to us trying to follow that law, or trying to follow the law of God for people who don't have the Bible, that law of God that he puts in our hearts where we know right from wrong, and we know that there's a God out there, and we know those things. And so as if, whether we're following the law or what's in our heart as we understand the law, we don't follow it completely perfectly. We're not 100% in that. We fail somewhere along the way, many places along the way, and so none of us can do it. We don't, it doesn't matter your culture. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your religious background. It doesn't matter because every one of us, when we try to say, I'm going to do everything that God tells me to do, we know that we come up short. And so we need some help. And that's the bad news of Romans 1 and 2 is that no matter who you are, if you try to make yourself righteous by being completely perfect, then you're not going to do it. You're going to fail. So in Romans chapter 3, Paul explains how the great, that, that grace is that free gift of God through the sacrifice of Jesus. It's received in faith, not by works of trying to follow and obey the law. And then in Romans chapter 4, Paul shows that how we are counted as righteous, how God credits that to our account, um, like in an accounting situation, or another way that he uses it, that we are justified, justified by faith. That's God's way of saving sinners. And Abraham, he's our example in chapter 4 because he's the father of all who would put their faith in God. And then we come to Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5, Paul explains the blessings of our salvation. And the number one blessing that he talks about is peace with God. Let's look at Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And so in Christ we have peace. We don't experience the wrath of God in Christ. We have a relationship with God as a child would with his parent or as we are part of a body, the body of Christ. Plus, we have that added bonus in our lives that when we have peace with God, then we can have peace in our lives and we can have peace in our surroundings and with the people that are around us. But until you have peace with God, then you'll never experience that type of peace in your life. So I, I need to ask you today something to think about as, as we contemplate this. If your heart is filled with turmoil, and if it's filled with confusion, then you need to take a look at your relationship with God. Maybe you haven't received that salvation that justifies you and cleanses you. Or maybe you don't even understand this gift that God has given to us that we have in Christ. Because that's what he's promised us. And so many people don't live in victory because they don't understand the power of what God has done in their lives. Peace is to be calm, not anxious, not worrying. No conflict in our relationship with God. And when I think about the peace of God, I think about many of the examples that, that we see throughout Scripture. Uh, one particular example is, is Daniel. You know, we looked at Daniel when we were going through the Old Testament. And as you think about Daniel, I mean, here's this young man, very young, a teenager, uh, taken from his land, taken to a foreign land as a captive, and then put into the king's service. And all these changes, all this that was going on in Daniel's life, but we can see right away that Daniel had a, a walk with the Lord, a relationship with God, and he had this peace in, that, in his understanding of God was with him. And so when 
things were out of order for him, when they wanted him to eat food that he felt like he shouldn't eat. He didn't, he didn't throw a fit. He didn't make a big scene. But in peace um, uh, and confidence, he said, I shouldn't eat this food. Let's just make, have this test. And let's see who does better in this test as we eat the different food. And this is what that I would like to eat. And so he was able to get through that situation um, without causing conflict uh, because of his relationship with God. And then it goes on. When, when the king had these dreams and everybody else was running around and afraid because they couldn't un, un, interpret that dream, Daniel went to his friends and asked them to pray. And then he went to the king and, and God gave him the word so that he could relay the message to the king of what that dream was. And then later on, when uh, with a different king and others um, try to get this king to uh, make a rule, a law, that um, you only pray to the king for these 30 days, Daniel didn't protest. He didn't get angry. He just went back home and did what he had always been doing. He prayed. He stayed calm and collected. He stayed cool through all of this because he had this peace with the, because of this relationship that he had with God. And then when he was thrown into the lion's den, as a result of that, well, he slept like a baby all night long. He wasn't worried about those lions because God had protected him. And so we see in Daniel, we see it in others, this idea of peace that we, we can go through life not full of anxiety, not full of fear, um, not worrying all the time, but living in peace because of of that relationship that we have in God. The resurrection, that power of God in our lives, the resurrection provides peace for us because that's a promise from Jesus. Secondly, the resurrection provides perseverance. Jesus said this world brings tribulation. He's warning his disciples. The Bible warns us that this world around us brings tribulation, that there are going to be problems around in our lives. We're going to suffer at times. We're going to, we're going to be uncomfortable. We're going to have experiences that we don't like. All these things are going to happen, and Jesus told us that as he told those words to his disciples. If we jump back to Paul in the book of Romans, you know, after Paul spoke about peace, this peace that, that we have with God in Romans chapter 5, he then speaks about suffering that we experience as well, tribulation. And so back to that verse that we started with in verse 2, he said that we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have our hope in the Lord, and that's very important. And so he's focusing on this idea of hope. Uh, because of that relationship that we have with peace, that peace with God that leads to a complete trust in God, we put our hope in the Lord. And so then let me ask you some questions this morning. These are rhetorical. You don't have to answer them out loud. So what do you do when things don't go your way? How do you respond to that when, when you go through times of trouble? Do you question God? Do you get mad at God? Do you try to give God advice? You know, those prayers of, Lord, this is the way I think you need to direct my path right now. These are the things that you need to get into my life or take out of my life right now. Or, with not doing those things, will you just trust the Lord in the midst of all of that, put your hope in him, and see the good that God would bring through those difficult times? If you want to continue in this relationship of peace with God, then we need to focus on trusting him, to put our hope in him, because that's what Paul is talking about in chapter 5. And then that's when he continues with this idea of suffering. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our, heart, our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now that is a message from someone who had peace with God, and he was, and he was going through those times of suffering and tribulation, and he could trust in the Lord and have hope in him. How else can you rejoice 
in your suffering. Suffering's no fun. Nobody wants to experience suffering. Usually our prayers are to get rid of the suffering because we're giving God advice, right? To get rid of that suffering. Uh, but the Bible wants to show us that as we can trust the Lord in the midst of that, we can grow through this process. Uh, because Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. So I, um, as you know, I compete in triathlons. Sometimes it might be a local triathlon around here at the island. Uh, maybe it's somewhere farther away. It might be a sh shorter triathlon. It might be a longer triathlon. And you know, when, when, you, when you compete with the shorter events, the ones that are around here, uh, there's, you know, you have certain goals. I have certain goals anyway, and that is to uh, place on that podium of to be first or second or third in, in your age group. And I'll say this, you know, I'm in an older age group, but there's more than one person in that age group. I'll say that now. Um, and so when you do that, you get a little trophy or a little plaque that says, hey, you did very well today um, in, in your, in your, in your um, triathlon. But if it's, um, if it's that bigger triathlon, um, then it's, you're not going to, you know, for people like me, you're not going to be on a podium. So then it's you want that finisher medal, right? You want to say, I finished this thing that I started. And this is what they, that they give to us. I, I kind of tease people because, you know, a long time ago when I first started running, they only gave medals if you did like marathons and stuff. Now they give medals for everything, um, and that's okay. That's great. Let's celebrate. But um, it's 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 a whole different world that we're in. But um, yeah, you look forward to that finisher medal because you've done it. But if that if that triathlon is short, if that triathlon is long, it doesn't matter. If you're trying hard, you're going to suffer. Now you might suffer hard on that short one because. I want this. I want to beat those other guys in my age group. Now, I'm not mean about it. I'm nice to them out there, but I want to beat them. I mean, I'm competitive. We're, we're competitive people. Um, and, and so because of that, you try a little bit harder. You try to run a little faster, swim a little bit faster, uh, ride a little bit faster. And that, that brings about some suffering. But you can rejoice in the suffering because of what you're looking forward to at the end. And even in the long ones, when you just get the, you know, the finisher medal, you can rejoice in the suffering because of what you're hoping for at the end of that. So that's just what the way we are in life. And then those triathlons, they require that daily training to be ready to, to be disciplined, to, to do something every day, maybe two things every day, as you want to get yourself ready for that next event um, that you have. Now, in life, Many things in our lives, um, if we're going to be disciplined, you know, you've made that choice, right? I need to be disciplined in this area of my life, okay? I need to be disciplined here. If you're going to be disciplined, and if that's your choice, it's going to require suffering for many of those things that we need to be disciplined with. And again, this is rhetorical. You don't have to answer out loud. Do you have discipline in your eating? Do you have discipline in getting exercise? Do you have discipline in trying to accomplish something in your life that might be difficult? If not, you're not rejoicing in your suffering because you're avoiding it. And that's what we are. If we're not going to discipline ourselves to accomplish something, then we're not going to rejoice in the suffering because we're staying away from the suffering. Okay? And in our spiritual life, as we seek to follow the Lord, as when we go through life and in, and in our physical life, when we go through life and we experience things, we're, we're either able to say, Lord, I see you involved in this and I'm rejoicing in you because I remember the words of the Bible where it says that this suffering produces endurance and this endurance is producing character, changing my character. And that character is producing hope. And my hope in you will never fail. Because your hope never fails. And so if in, in life, as we are living every day of our life, are we willing to say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to do your will and be disciplined in this situation so that I can grow in my character and I grow in that hope, my understanding of who you are. If you're not, if you won't do that, you won't rejoice in your suffering. 
you're going to try to avoid it. And you're going to ask God to get rid of it. And then there's no endurance and there's no character. And maybe there's no um, uh, growing in that understanding of your hope. And it could be anything in life. So, for example, um, there was a, when we moved here many years ago, we moved here. There's a man in our congregation that was in a wheelchair. And so, you know, you want to know what's going on. So I had a visit with he and his wife one day. And um, in the conversation, I said, what happened? Why are, why are you in a wheelchair? And he said, I had hip surgery. I said, oh, wow, did it go bad? Was it an unsuccessful surgery? Did something mess up through, throughout that, through the surgery? He said, oh, no, no, the surgery was fine. He says, I started the physical therapy, and it hurt too much, so I quit. So he chose to live the rest of his life in a wheelchair because he wasn't willing to rejoice in his suffering, looking forward to what was happening at the end. So in life, what are we missing in our relationship with God and our walk with God and the victory that God wants to um, show us in our lives? If we're, if we're not going to rejoice in the suffering, we're going to just say, Lord, I don't want any of it, and I want to stay away from it. Instead of, Lord, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to hope in you and I'm going to follow you no matter what. Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. There will be suffering. So we can, we can rejoice in our suffering when we can see that God is at work. And he's changing us and helping us, developing that character and hope. And that resurrection provides perseverance for us because Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. It will be there. It will come. So let's persevere through it and follow our Lord and have victory. What else does the resurrection provide? The resurrection provides power. You know, last um, on Thursday night when I prayed with you, um, that when you came up for communion, I finished the, each one of those prayers with a little phrase of, Lord, help us to always remember the power of, of the resurrection. I was just something I did on purpose. That, you know, that was a message I just wanted to, to put into all of our hearts as we prayed together. And we, and we recognize that, 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 that resurrection power of Christ is so important for us. Because again, once the, there was an understanding of the resurrection, there was a change in the disciples. We read about that in scripture. Jesus said, remember, he says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. Um, I give you peace. In this world, you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's what he did. So we put our trust in Jesus and what he has done for us. He overcame the world. He defeated sin. He de defeated death. He defeated the plans of the evil one, and he makes us victors. We have victory we are overcomers by the power of the Holy Spirit that we receive in Christ. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 8, verse 37 to 39. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God has given us power to believe and achieve and have victory. We have power to stand firm. We have power to overcome sin. We have power to do God's will in our lives so that we can please him and live for him. In Christ, God's Holy Spirit lives in you and brings power. Last week, I reminded you that through God's Spirit, we don't have to live um, anxious lives, being afraid, being oppressed by events surrounding us. We don't have to live that life. We live a life of victory, a life of calmness, a life of peace. Do you, re do you realize how much power you have in Christ? You know, again, you think about it. Think of the disciples and how they were when they, you know, with, with Jesus and, and how 
uh, anemic they seem to be at times in this idea of spiritual power. And then you fast forward to the book of Acts, and which we're starting to read now in our reading through the Bible. As you read through the book of Acts, you can see this, um, this work of God in their life and the Holy Spirit working through them. And they have confidence and conviction, and they are doing God's will with power. This, this gift of God's power is so um, important for us to understand. And sometimes... It's that we just don't understand how much power God has given us. And when we don't understand it, then we just live this life without victory, without seeing God working in our lives. So since I've been talking about triathlons, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the training. And so with um, training, you have to um, hydrate, right? You have to make sure you're drinking your fluids, and you can't just drink water. You have to drink something with electrolytes in it because you need that, that salt in your system because you're sweating it all out, especially down here if you're doing all these workouts in the, you know, the hot weather that's around here. And so um, I make sure that as I prepare for um, getting out on a ride or a run that I, that I have a, a water bottle, several water bottles ready. Um, and, it, and fill it with electrolytes. And there's different ways of doing that. Um, one of them is um, this little, these little fizzy tablets, okay? And they, in this little container here, there's one tablet, and it's, it's supposed to be good for one bottle of, of water. So you pour your water in here, you drop the little tablet in there, and it's kind of like Alka-Seltzer. You know, it starts fizzing as it, as it dissolves into the water and um, creating those bubbles and all that. And so I, I get all my water bottles that I need, and I set them out, and I put the water in and put the tablets in and let it start doing its work. And then later I come back and I, uh, I put the lid on it and have it all ready to go and make sure the top of the lid is closed and get it on my bike and, and, and then take off for my ride. Well, one particular night, I remember this, it was, um, it was a really hot day. We're riding in the evening. I knew it was going to be really hot. I was going to sweat a lot, so I thought... I don't think I'm going to put one fizzy tablet in here. I think I'm going to put two fizzy tablets in here because I really need the extra uh, salt because I know that, that I'm, I'm going to uh, um, you know, sweat a lot. I'm going to need that to replenish myself. And so I did. And I let it set and all that, put the lid on it, closed the lid, put it on the bike and started riding. And so I, I got to that point in the ride where I was ready to take my first drink of water. And so you're riding, you know, you've got your two hands on, on, on the bike. And so you take one hand and you reach and you grab your water bottle. And you don't go, hey, mom, look at me. I'm riding with no hands and open this. You're hanging on to it. So you open it with your teeth. So you put the water bottle into your mouth and use your teeth and you pull it open and you open the top of it. I don't know how many pounds per square inch was in that water bottle, but it felt like if you could understand being over top of Old Faithful when she goes off, if you can kind of imagine that, as soon as I opened up this little valve here, uh, all the pressure that had built up in this water bottle went gushing through to the very back of my mouth, um, down my throat, and I'm, I'm choking and spitting and spewing and doing all those things. Um, trying to look cool as I'm riding with my friends, you know. <laughs> so sometimes we just don't know how much power is in things around us. And I think for us, as we follow the Lord, sometimes we don't recognize the power of God and what the power of God does in our life. Now, that doesn't mean that he's going to take the Holy Spirit and, and choke us down with it and we're spewing and spitting as a result of that but we might miss out on the things that God has for us and miss out on that victory that he wants us to experience. So today, as we remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ, let's remember what that resurrection does for us, how it changed the life of his disciples, and it changes our lives because we have peace, we have perseverance, and we have power in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you for... Um, this time today and this opportunity to be able to open up your word and, and to learn from you. And I just pray that you would be an encouragement to each one of us today to follow you and trust you in everything. In Jesus' name, amen. As we have our invitation song this morning, if there's a decision you need to make for Christ, we want to give you that opportunity. I'll be down here. If you have a prayer request and would like me to pray with you, feel free to come forward and pray. Let's stand together as we sing.